Hi, welcome everyone. Um, we'll just give uh, we'll just give it about a minute um, so that people can, as they start to join and enter into the session, and then we'll get started. Welcome uh, to the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center Firefighter Cancer Initiative Seminar Series. Uh, this morning we have a joint presentation uh, with Paolo Lozado Feliciano, sorry about that, uh, and Umar Bakali. Um, it is self-reported and objectively measured occupational exposures, health and safety concerns among U.S. fire investigators. Um, our two presenters, uh, Paolo will be presenting first, followed by Umar. Um, we'll take questions uh, just for anybody who's new. Um, the Q&A function in your Zoom is where you can ask questions. Um, so, you know, right at the bottom of your Zoom or in your control panel for Zoom, the Q&A feature, you can type in questions. We'll hold most of them till the end of um, the, in, the individual parts, the first and second parts. Um, and then we will have time for some discussion and uh, for the presenter to answer questions. Today, we also have with us um, our one of our uh, co-PIs, Dr. Natasha schaefer Sale, who will introduce, um, as well as Dr. Sylvia Donner, who has joined us. So with that, I will turn it over uh, to Dr. Sale. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm sorry you can't see us. Uh, I'm actually here with Dr. Caban Martinez. Uh, we are really excited to introduce uh, Paola Usado and uh, Umar Bakali as they present to us on a really important topic with our colleagues in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Over the past couple of years, we've been trying to understand and develop a richer and deeper understanding of the health effects of our fire investigators. Collaboration and teamwork is essential to making the work through our Firefighter Cancer Initiative happen. And we're thankful to all the fire investigators that participated in, in the research project that made today's findings possible. We're really delighted to share the interim findings of an investigation looking at the occupational health and safety concerns of fire investigators, as well as the characterization of their exposures while they're out on the field. Please join Dr. Shali and I in welcoming Ms. Paola Luzado Feliciano and Umar Bakali as they present to us on this important topic. Oh, thank you guys. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Paolo, you're muted. Okay, now, sorry. That was weird. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kavan and Dr. Sully, for that introduction. Um, so, Boomer, next slide. I guess we can begin right away. So, I guess I wanted to first begin with a little bit of background um, on fire investigators and how we got to um, investigating more about this subtype of firefighters. So, when we usually think about um, fire, research for this occupational group, we think about the traditional um, paid firefighter. However, um, as research progressed, we noticed that not all firefighters are exposed to carcinogens equally. So as you can note in the pictures, or you can click like next four times, um, you notice that there's different subtypes of firefighters. So for example, um, if we have different subtype of firefighters like fire investigators, wild and urban interface firefighters, volunteer firefighters, and fire trainers. And um, they all have unique exposures. So if we think about wild and urban interface fires, um, these type of firefighters might not wear the same respiratory protection that you think about um, when you see a structural firefighter. And they might still be exposed to carcinogen and combustion products from both synthetic and natural materials. Same if you think about fire instructors, um, they may experience ongoing exposures to air contaminants um, that are not, um, that might exceed those of the structural traditional 
firefighter. Um, and then for a seminar today, like it has been mentioned, we're gonna be focusing on fire investigator subgroups. So Umar, you can just click um, four times. Is it not going? Can you see it? Okay, yeah, no, sorry, now I see it. So for um, when we think about fire investigators, this type of um, firefighter is present um, in the aftermath of a fire to identify, collect, and analyze evidence of the fire's origin. So during and after overhaul, fire investigators may be exposed to vapors, gases, and particular matter that can eventually contribute to chronic health diseases, including cancer. Um, and then if you can observe in the picture in the background, we have here a fire investigator that's really close to the debris, and he's taking pictures. Um, he's not wearing um, a respiratory mask and he might be um, exposed to hazardous chemicals. Next slide. So despite um, their unique work um, exposures, little is still known about how they perceive their risk as an investigator or what are their health concerns. So today, um, Umar and I are going to be talking about two main objectives. The first one is how we characterize the health and safety concerns of US fire investigators, and Umar is going to be touching on the characterizations of chemical exposures during fire investigations. Next. So um, to begin, um, we designed a qualitative study and um, because we wanted to better understand what were the exposures of and the perceived occupational safety risks of fire investigators. So participants were eligible to join our study as long as they were an active fire investigator. And our focus group discussions usually lasted between 60 and 90 minutes. Um, we use a semi-structure um, focus group uh, script at a convenient location. So before we um, began our discussion, we would consent the firefighters, we would administer a short 18-question um, demographic survey because we also wanted to characterize who was sitting at our table. Um, we gave space for fire investigators to ask any questions they might have, and um, we also um, uh, had with us two um, team members. So the first one was a moderator and the second one would be somebody like me, a research associate. The moderator would, would go over the questions. Our focus group script had five domains. So job description, perceived hazards at work, cancer risk, information needs for risk reduction, and engagement in national occupational cohort study. And then we also had a research associate taking notes throughout the um, the focus group um, discussion. Um, at the end, we conducted a total of nine focus group discussions um, across different states here in the United States, and we had a total of 71 fire investigators um, sit in our table and talk with us. Um, we conducted invest sorry, we conducted discussions um, until we reached saturation. So we didn't really set a limit of the total amount of, of discussions we were going to conduct. We stopped um, doing discussions as soon as we started hearing um, sort of like the same answers per um, discussion. In terms of participant recruitment, we adopted a convenient sampling method um, because we reach out to departments that we knew had fire investigators working under them. And we would set up meetings with leadership and we would ex you know, explain to them the study and then they would go back to their department and ask um, the group of fire investigators if they were interested in participating in our project. Um, we would then reach out with an email, which included our fire, um, as you can see, our flyer, and they had the option to participate or not. So it was completely voluntarily. Um, and then after we had like our list of who was interested from that department, we would set um, a date and a time that would work best for everybody. Um, and we would conduct the discussion. As you can note in the map, these were the four states where we recruited participants from. Next slide. And I just wanted to show like what our traditional field operations looks like. So um, usually we we um, we like to have sort of like a round table where it feels a little bit homier. We want to we have a space where the our participants feel comfortable in sharing, um, you know their experiences with us. So we noted over the years that this is the way that they feel the most comfortable. 
Um, and as you can note, we usually place a, uh, a verbal consent form. And underneath that verbal consent form, we have the one page demographic questionnaire, which is, sorry, on my right. And um, nothing after we give them the spiel of the study, we uh, let them, we have space for questions and then they start the survey. After they start the survey um, and finish it, we begin our focus group discussion. Next slide. So in terms of data analysis, we use an inductive approach to analyze our qualitative data and we use the in vivo software to um, code all of our transcripts. We went through three rounds of coding. Um, and in terms of quantitative data, we use SPSS. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, um, we had a total of 71 firefighters participate in our focus group discussions, um, of which 93% were male and Caucasian, about 50% were Latino, um, about 50% were also college graduates, and our mean group age was 47.9 years. And approximately 35% of all our participants um, had reported a second job, and they were pretty seasoned, so they had to work um, an average of 8.6 years. Next slide. So four broad themes emerged from our nine focus group discussions that described fire investigator workplace roles and responsibilities, um, occupational exposures that impact their health and safety, personal protective equipment practices and fire department policies, and their perceived cancer burden. So I'm gonna go over each one. Um, next slide. So the first theme um, that we're gonna talk about is fire investigators in addition to um, conducting investigations have multiple roles within fire departments that result in increased occupational exposure to physical, mental, and emotional hazards. So when we ask fire investigators to describe their job and their typical work week, participants across the country share that their role as an investigator varies greatly based on organizational structure. So even though they might have been working within the same department, they might have also been working for a private company or federal agency. So there were um, differences among them. However, they did collectively share that their lack of regular work hours is a leading concern in regard to seeing healthy and safe on the job. So for example, one of our participants shared, not only do you do your daily duties from eight to five or seven to four, Monday through Friday, then you take on a call after you get off. We have a take home vehicle and we'll respond out whenever an engine company calls us or needs us to assist in an origin and cause investigation. You can get called at two in the morning, five in the morning, whatever time the pager goes off, you respond out and assist. So um, this is just an example of one of the quotes that were mentioned um, in our discussions. Fire investigators also described how the nature of the job impacts their ability to wear appropriate personal protective equipment. So if we think about the picture I showed in the beginning when describing fire investigators, you can see that um, it kind of it's hard, it would be really hard for an investigator to work, to wear the bulky turnout gear with the respiratory mask that your typical structural firefighter would just because they have to get underneath to take pictures. They also rebuild um, the scene after fire suppression. Um, so their nature of the job, their, the nature of their job truly really impacts on um, what type of PPE they can wear. Um, they also share that the conditions in which investigations are performed, um, a lot of times they spend uh, long hours investigating a fire. So before we did this discussions, like I would think, oh, they go investigate for a few hours, a few hours might be days. So um, those are days that they might be inside a structure, um, inhaling debris or, you know, carcinogenic compounds. Next slide. So theme number two, policies and practices surrounding occupational health and safety. Sorry. Policies and practices surrounding occupational health and safety are not clearly defined within the fire investigation workforce, but have adapted and improved over time. So as I previously mentioned, um, the nature of work as a fire investigator impacts your health and safety, um, which can be further impacted by limited organizational policies and practices in place to protect and promote um, workplace health and wellness. So although there are policies surrounding post-fire scene, on-scene decontamination and rehab um, for investigators, they might have not been adapted to truly serve their needs because a lot of the times, for example, 
it was mentioned they would if they wanted to perform decon um after they're done with their investigating the scene where could they truly do it there sometimes their office did not have um, a shower where they could just go and decon over there or like it was mentioned previously like they have a work vehicle so they would go home um and for example a uh participant mentioned a lot of times we're on the scene kind by ourselves so we don't really have somebody to decon us per se it would be impossible to decon yourself which was also mentioned in, um in our discussions that um we when we think about the scene like you have the firefighters when they're done they leave and the fire investigators come to investigate the fire all of the times they might be there by themselves or they might just have like an assistant but they don't truly really have the necessary equipment to decon um, by themselves um and um next slide so for um, the number three implementation practices regarding the use and access of personal protective equipment for fire investigators is not standardized among the workforce. So um, firefighter investigators share various degrees of implementation surrounding the use and access of PPE. So when we ask them, like, what do you wear to protect yourself when you're a seat, it truly varied across departments, states. Um, and sort of like that organizational structure, just because there were certain items that they would mention they would wear, like helmets, gloves sometimes, boots, um, long sleeves, but um, there wasn't really a consensus of um, what they would wear, like, oh, we always wear a respiratory mask or at least a face mask. Um, and for example, one fire, fire, fire investigator mentioned helmet always wearing um, a long sleeve shirt, pants, rubber boots. I'll put on rubber gloves and then a pair of leather gloves over top of them usually, just depending on what I'm trying to do. Sometimes it's not practical because you're constantly pulling your camera and taking pictures with your camera. Now you've got to take your gloves off so you don't contaminate your camera as well as the gloves. So like I mentioned, um, the nature of the job is they truly get to the ground where there's debris. So it's kind of like hard if they're all if we you know make a policy you're all going to wear x type of ppe because we know it protects you but it also would get in the way of you um performing your job task next slide so our final theme fire investigators have a greater perceived risk of exposure to carcinogenic compounds both known and unknown elements and subsequent increased risk of developing cancer so um, fire investigators have minimal standards for procedures and policies for PPE, decon, um, which they know results in um, a greater risk for cancer. And this was greatly discussed during our um, focus group discussions. They describe, describe that they understand that they have this higher risk of exposure because, like I mentioned, they compare their, like, they are there are they have been firefighters so when they compare like what they would wear when they go into a structure versus what they wear um during the investigation it truly is different um and next slide so um sort of to end the um qualitative portion of um, the presentation, I wanted to end with two key messages. So fire investigators perform multiple job tasks in the fire service with few policies and procedures in place aim at reducing their exposures to carcinogenic compounds. Um, and the second key message that I want to leave is that further characterization of chemical exposures is needed during investigations, which is what Umar is going to be talking about shortly. Um, and I also wanted to highlight this quote that um, it sort of like stuck with me after hearing these discussions and it's, it's not a matter of it, it's when, and they're referring of if as like to cancer, but I don't want to see that in the younger generation. If they can prevent it now, I want to help them make the change. So I think um, this is, it's a really strong quote because fire investigators know about this risk and they truly want to um, prevent it for the future generations to come. Next. And now Umar is going to be talking about um, our second study objective. All righty, thank you, Paola, for the handoff. Um, so I will be going over the characterization of chemical exposures that we saw in fire investigators uh, from the North Carolina um, region. 
So typically when we go over, uh, when we look at exposures in firefighters, we use polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are a class of carcinogenic compounds as kind of our model molecule. And the reason why these are so, I, I would say like effective to look at is because they have a behavior that can, that is kind of a medium between particles and vapor, which allows us to model how firefighters might be exposed to vapors in the fire environment or to particulate matter in the fire environment. Um, so these are produced during uh, the process of incomplete combustion. Uh, anywhere that you go that has a fire, usually it's burning some sort of fuel that contains carbon. Any sort of fire will have a fuel rich oxygen poor environment. And when you have that, you'll start off with your fuel and your oxidizer eventually producing ox uh, these aromatic compounds through incomplete combustion, which slowly but surely turn into particulate matter. And this stuff gets everywhere. Uh, that's why we and that's why there's initiatives um, that have been put forth for firefighters to clean their gear. You can see here, uh, this is an example of very dirty firefighter gear. More importantly, when pHs are internalized, their metabolites can cause DNA damage. So of course these are carcinogens. So like I said, pHs get everywhere. Um, when the firefighter is exposed or fire investigator is exposed, it gets on their turnout gear. It can get onto their engine or personal vehicle. They can take it back with them to the fire station. Uh, and they can, you know, unfortunately communicate it to their family and friends or whoever they come into contact with. So before I go into our data, before I go into what exactly we saw on wristbands we shared with uh, the fire investigators, I just wanted to go into how exactly we generate our data. How exactly do we sample? Uh, to do that, we use silicone wristbands. And in a nutshell, the way that these wristbands work is that they're like sponges for compounds in the atmosphere. Uh, when you're wearing them, they will be sticky to uh, the semi-volatile and volatile organic compounds inside the air. And we can use them in all sorts of environments. So we've employed them inside a uh, a Pelican case, a box filled with used firefighter gear to see uh, what was off-gassing from used firefighter gear. We've employed them for firefighters who were inside their stations just to see what is the background contamination inside the station. As you can see, this is just soot from inside the station on this firefighter's finger. Uh, we published this, all these findings all last year. But even more uh, int intriguingly, we can also use these in environmental contexts too. These are very, very versatile tools. Uh, so here's a picture of me with a fire chief when we went to the Mexico Beach disaster zone in October of 2018 after Hurricane Michael had hit. We linked up with firefighters in that area and, uh, and gave them wristbands to see what sort of exposure that they had. We went to controlled burns in Coconut Grove and in St. Petersburg to see how PAHs might disperse throughout the active fire environment in a live fire situation. And we've also just left these wristbands in the environment in general, just to pick up background contamination in the environment. So these are very, very useful tools. <clears throat> and we use them in conjunction with a, a tool called GCMS. Uh, to use it though, we Take the um, we take the wristbands from the fire, from the firefighters or fire investigators and we extract them, and this allows us to get all of the compounds that were stuck to that matrix, the silicone, into a liquid form. We can concentrate it and then place it into a GCMS for analysis. And to simplify what GCMS is, it is essentially just an obstacle course for the compounds inside your sample. When you take your sample and you inject it into GCMS, it goes into a column and the column allows us to separate each one of those compounds that we have. So in our case, we're looking for the 16 priority pHs that have been listed by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, once these compounds move through the column, they all have a fingerprint. They go through a mass spec, which is essentially you blast these compounds with ions, it breaks them apart and every single time they'll all break apart in the same way. This allows us to fingerprint these compounds and we can tell, yes, this is naphthalene or this is phenanthrene or whatever other pH or other compound. So before I get into what we found on the fire investigators, uh, we 
looked at the response data that we had from them. Uh, we had a total of 16 fire investigators participate in this wristband study, um, and they gave us a total of 27 wristbands back, each one of them corresponding to a separate fire investigation. Uh, the average investigation duration was about three hours. So that's um, the time frame for which most of these wristbands would be corresponding to with a, with a minimum of 19 minutes and a maximum of 14 hours. So you can see there's a large variation in how long these fire investigators may be at a post-fire scene. Um, and most investigations took place within the same day of the fire to maybe three days afterwards, but there are occasions where perhaps a fire investigator may repeat after you know 30 or 40 days. There was a maximum of 60 some odd days that a fire investigator may return to a scene. And so this allows us to get an impression of what firefighters are being exposed to long after the fire has been extinguished. And they come back. So overwhelmingly, what we saw for these fire investigators is that they're being exposed to lower molecular weight PAHs, which is not really that surprising to us because uh, lower molecular weight PAHs are easier to volatilize. They go into the air easier at lower temperatures. 90% um, of the exposure was actually attributable to lower molecular weight PAHs. Um, so that accounts for basically everything that you see above crisine. So naphthalene all the way down to fluorinthine is considered lower molecular weight. And what this tells us is that fire investigators are predominantly exposed to these pHs during the off-gassing that's occurring post-fire. So in summary, um, we have seen that uh, fire investigators do sustain quite significant pH exposure during their on-site audits. Um, and, this, and these audits will occur within days of the fire event. So it's not as if these pHs just go away as soon as the fire is extinguished. Uh, although they're lower molecular weight pHs, they are comprising the majority of their exposure. And we do recommend that fire investigators, of course, employ PPE, at least respirator masks to reduce their exposure risk, because as these compounds off-gas, it's easy for them to inhale these compounds. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, firefighters uh, from North Carolina and from the state of Florida and uh, all the FCI, and uh, thank you all for listening. I'll go ahead and take any questions. Thank you, Paola. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, Paola and Umer for a wonderful presentation. Um, so we'll open up the floor to a couple of different uh, questions, either from our firefighters or from our science colleagues um, on today's results. So would anybody like to um, initiate the Q&A session either on the chat um, or uh, go ahead and feel free to vocalize your question. Yes, our, our slides will be publicly available and we're happy to, to share them as, a, as well. Okay, presenters. So we have a question in the chat room um, from Fire Marshal Lund uh, in Iowa. Are there any specific recommendations to avoid the pH exposure for the fire investigators? Uh, so I can definitely go ahead and answer that. And I know um, Dr. Asali and Alberto, um, you can both uh, kind of chime in. Um, so I know for pH exposure, uh, firefighters, structural firefighters will wear their turnout gear and they'll be on contained air. And as we can see from Paola's portion of the presentation, that's not always convenient for fire investigators. Um, but this really is kind of their first line of defense to avoid pH exposure, to avoid um, getting it on their skin and avoid getting it inside themselves through, through uh, inhalation. Um, but afterwards, there's also uh, um, been protocols to you know, shower within the hour to make sure to you know, whatever did get on your skin or whatever did get on your body can be washed off um, and also to clean your gear to avoid um, having that 
be communicated throughout your environment. Uh, thank you, Marpola. Is there anything you'd like to opine? Um, I, not really what Umar sir said is totally what um, we would recommend, like we, I would also say, except that um, I do remember from discussions, like there was this um, kind of ask like, oh, if maybe I had a shower in my office, obviously that might depend on like the department you're working with because some people might have access to it, but sort of also making it easier for the investigator to like, oh, if they like, do they have what they need to shower within the hour? Um, so we also start thinking about like organizationally how we can also promote better practices. Um, it would be helpful. To I also it. wanted I, I also mm -hmm. wanted to mention just practically, you know, the, the science around what PPE best mitigates pH exposure on the scene is not there, right? Um, there's actually unfortunately very little science done in the area of fire investigators with some studies being done in the Swedish and Finnish countries. Um, so definitely not many here in the United States. Unfortunately, but just practical aspects of you know PPE use for fire investigators is paramount. So that means you know the most common mechanisms of absorption are dermal and respiratory, and so PPE that don't impact the dexterity of the fire investigator as they're trying to do their root cause analysis on the audit scene. Um, so if that means half masks, our colleagues at Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. Um, did a case study series looking at how even just using half masks when you're in the incident, um, sort of the yellow zone of fire incident response helped to, re to reduce some of the exposures. I wonder if fire investigators would consider using, um, you know, semi-protective, you know, half masks um, during the audit scene that don't block their visual fields, but still allow them to do that, as well as any dermal absorptions. And then clearly after the audit, sort of secondary prevention would be to wipe down. Um, so one of our wonderful work from our NIOSH colleagues has shown that basic soap and water um, alleviates uh, or reduces um, PAH exposure. So if there's an opportunity to hose down after a fire investigation or just use basic wipes to make sure that there's no soot on the uh, skin exposed surfaces of the investigation um, as best as possible. We realize that all varies by um, location. <laughs> you, know, you may be in a very cold area yeah. of the country or a very warm area of the country, but keeping um, sort of the basic practices of PPE use um, for now, um, as the science catches up to the practice of uh, being a fire investigator is really important. Sorry, you know, I'm Hispanic and I talk forever. Um, a couple of questions that come, come in here. Um, so any thoughts from our presenters on the type of clothing that plays a factor in the study and what did the investigators wear? Um, that was discussed in the study? Um, they would usually just say that they would wear like a long sleeve shirt, um, their overall pants, boots, um, and some of them would wear gloves, but that was about it. Um, and when I know that when we handed out the wristbands, they would just wear them typically what they would normally wear during an investigation. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Brian. I think, it, I think it did. Thank you, Paola. Um, okay, Chief Nemchuk has a question for us. Did the investigators know of the different types of respiratory protection available? Oh my goodness, forgive me, I lost my place here. Um, so for example, was it, a, was it education, lack of PPE, or a cultural reluctance to use the PPE during their audit investigation? I think for that question, it truly depends on location. Like when um, so for example, what we heard from California fire investigators might be different from what we heard from Florida uh, investigators. However, I can tell you that they did speak about, yes, we know there's these types of like respiratory protection available. It was more like how when they're in the job, like they might go in wearing it and then they're like, I need, I can't do it. So, um, I think they are educated on like the types of, um, respiratory protection that is available. Um, but it might be more like there's a lack of something that's comfortable enough for them to be able to, you know, perform their job or help them perform their job as best as possible. Because if they have to like be on the ground or whatever, like carrying a bulky respiratory mask or like an oxygen tank might just be too uncomfortable. And like if they're reconstructing the scene, it's just too hard for them to um, use. Thank, thank you, Paula. Okay, we have another question here in the chat. 
from firefighter Juan Garcia. So the question is, um, what, if any, is the transfer rate and or incidents to the vehicles that the investigators use? So in other words, if the PA just sort of linger at the um, fire sites, um, <clears throat> uh, do the vehicles undergo, should they undergo some sort of like wipe down procedure as well, separate and distinct from the actual firefighter? I mean, I can answer what I heard <laughs> and what I think. So um, from our discussions, fire investigators, they did mention that they do wipe down their trucks and if they have a dog with them, that as well. Um, just because a lot of them, they can just like strip down at the scene. So they might, you know, they sit in their car, they contaminate their car. So there is like a post decon of their vehicle or there's, you know, they, there should be because it would transfer to their vehicle. Okay, I agree. Um, okay, so um, there's one more comment in the chat I wanted to highlight for our colleagues that are in the in the uh, seminar today. So Jack Polly, Chief Polly from the International Association of Arson Investigators wanted to make sure that we all were aware of the white paper that their uh, committee has put together that addresses a lot of um, health and safety best practices for fire investigators. And it's addressed some of the issues that were, have been discussed on today's um, webinar. Are there any other questions um, from, our, from the folks on the um, Zoom, either through chat? Okay, well, we wanna thank you all today again for your time through these um, monthly seminars of the Firefighter Cancer Initiative. I wanna extend um, our thanks to our colleagues and the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, Dr. Donner and Dr. Dale for their um, cross collaboration and making some of this magic happen and bridging um, population level sciences with, um, with our basic sciences. And I wanna especially thank our two presenters today who are trainees and staff who led um, the work, it's always, uh, you know, FCI is not also about investigating cancer in the fire service, but also training the next generation of fire investigators. And we're thankful to our presenters today um, for leading that charge um, and talking about our fire investigators. Hopefully this will be a line of inquiry and investigation we continue um, for many more years. Um, so thank you all. And we will, I'll pass it back to um, our moderator, um, Ms. Uh, Cynthia Herrera. Theory. Theory. Sorry. Thanks, Albert. Just wanted to thank Paola and Umar for a wonderful presentation. And this is when, you know, the moments where I see and, and I feel how strong our collaboration is. And, and uh, you know, and it's a tripartite, the firefighters and, and both our labs. And I'm really proud of how well uh, Paola and Umar represent us and show the kind of scientists that they are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Goddard. Thanks, Sylvia. Thank you. Yeah. And on, on that note, I think it's the, the perfect note to end our uh, FCI seminar series for this project period. Um, but we are not done um, with our project period ending in June 30th. But before that, we will be hosting the National Firefighter Cancer Symposium, um, the 2021 version. To register, please go to sylvester.org slash NFCS, so National Firefighter Cancer Symposium. It is going to be held June 10th through 12th. Um, we will have more um, from our speakers today at the symposium and uh, a host of other topics. Um, so please go to our website and to the registration page um, to see the full agenda. Again, it's June 9th through 12th. Um, the National Firefighter Cancer Symposium, you can go to our website, sylvester.org slash NFCS to register. Well, thank you all. And we look forward to a great project year um, and another sem seminar series next year. Stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.